welcome again. Thank you for being here. As you could have, you saw, I mean, we'll be, we'll be discussing Yemen. And as you all know, it's seven years of uninterrupted conflict, which means, of course, that uh, the civilians have suffered the most and are suffering the most. And it's an indefinite state of war with no clear way out on how to move forward. And that is exactly why, I mean, we are discussing here with Minister for Foreign and Expatriate Affairs from Yemen, Dr. Ahmed Awad bin Mubarak, and we'll be joined uh, by Timothy Lender King, Special Envoy for Yemen for the United States. And there is a lot to discuss about because there is a lot of suffering on the ground. So first of all, thank you for joining us. Also, now I see Dr. Lender King and uh, Dr. Bin Mubarak, and I would start from you. Uh, seven years of ongoing civil war, we just said. So I would like you to describe the situation on the ground, especially regarding Al Hudaida and Marib, where the fighting is still going on. And I mean, we have seen pictures, reports of famine, children. So what is your perspective? What is going on? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, allow me at the beginning to uh, extend my thanks to my uh, colleague, uh, uh, the, foreign the Italian Foreign Minister uh, Di Maio, and also for the Italian Institute for International uh, Political uh, Studies uh, uh, for inviting me in, this, in the seventh edition of uh, Roma Dialogue, Mediterranean Dialogue. Uh, and I'm very glad also uh, to be with uh, the... With discuss uh, Yemen without you would be impossible. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, no, I mean, I'm also very glad to have, you know, my colleague, my friend, uh, Tim Linder King, whom he, I mean, uh, uh, put a lot of, of his energy and the, the weight of the United States uh, uh, trying to resolve this problem. And I'm sure, uh, I mean, with uh, having him in this, in, this, uh, in this discussion, I mean, we will be able to explain a lot about the current situation in Yemen. Uh, no doubt if you ask me this question a few months ago, I will be more optimistic than now. Uh, at that time, we were, uh, there were many new elements on the, on the, on the table, a new envoy, uh, the, the United States, uh, you know, the uh, Biden administration, and they came and they put Yemen in their priorities. Uh, everyone is tired, I mean, inside Yemen, there is real will to, to end the war. Uh, uh, and there were a very practical proposal on the table, starting with ceasefire, uh, 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 some, some, some uh, uh, economical and humanitarian arrangement returning back to the table, the Omani rules, so many pieces, and that increased the expectation, and everyone th thinks that you know, it's the time to end this war. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the response from the other side, mainly from the Houthis militias, was totally negative. The uh, total refusal for all these proposals, uh, even they re-escalate, uh, they escalated the, the, their military aggression in Marib uh, and uh, lately also in, 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 in Hodeidah. So now there is a military escalation everywhere. Uh, I don't want to discuss its uh, consequences, which is the humanitarian uh, tragedy that, you know, the ordinary people, the Yemenis are, uh, are suffering. Add to, the, that, add to that the COVID-19 and uh, the economical challenges. So uh, it's, it's really difficult, the situation. It's really, uh, now we are, uh, there is uh, hope, there is a new envoy. He is now exploring the, all the possibilities to resume the political talks. He was in Aden, he, he came, I met him there. He visited Taiz for the first time. He went to the West Coast, uh, but yet not with the Houthis in Sana'a because they didn't receive him yet. Uh, so w w w uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, cooperate with him. We have, you know, uh, our position as Yemeni government that there is no military uh, solution for this conflict. At the end, we as Yemenis, we have to sit on the table and we have to resolve our problem. We are ready to do that. After all what Houthis did, we said they are most welcome to join the, the, the table. They have to respect just one constitutional principle, which is that all Yemenis are equal. No one has any... Uh, uh, no one is superior or have divine right to rule the, the rest of the so, Yemenis. Uh, it's basically, I mean, you say, we agreed on a ceasefire, it's the Houthis don't, that don't want to sit down at the table. Yes. Um, Timothy Lenderking, so I, I would like you to bring you in immediately. 
It's one year after President Biden's initial appeal to end the conflict through a new diplomatic approach. But here we are hearing that uh, it is sort of, it went into a stalemate. According to you, uh, which are the steps that need to be done and what went wrong, according to you? Well, thank you very much, uh, Maria. And again, let me echo the thanks of His Excellency, uh, the Foreign Minister, toward the Italian Institute for hosting. And thank you all for, for being here. It, it's very important, I think, in, this, in such a gathering to have a session on Yemen. So I'm very glad that we're devoting the time uh, toward this. And I'm sorry I can't be there in, in person, but delighted to be here uh, virtually. Um, you know, the, uh, the Biden administration, of all the regional conflicts, uh, back in February, decided to, to, to highlight uh, Yemen. And there were several reasons for this. Not that it was somehow easier than anything else, but it was the combination of the fact that uh, a realization that there is no military solution, as His Excellency just said, um, and, and that the, uh, the humanitarian situation is as dire as it is. So uh, you know, again, it's a staging ground where Iranian influence uh, plays a major role. And I think the administration felt that with the appointment of an envoy and taking this initial first step, which was to undesignate uh, the Houthi organization as a terrorist organization, um, something that I think the administration hoped would be received in a positive way in Sana'a. Um, as, a, as, a, as an indication that the administration was taking a different path from a more hardline uh, Trump administration, um, which did not prioritize a political solution as much as the Biden team did. So, and, and to answer your question specifically in terms of what went wrong, I think the, the issue is that all of those factors that the foreign minister just outlined are still at play. And for anybody who, I think, felt that there was going to, going to be an easy solution or a quick win in Yemen, I think, was not viewing the situation realistically. I do believe, however, that with the decision of a handful of people, there could be a ceasefire in Yemen. And there could be more traction on the humanitarian situation, because I think as the donors uh, feel some reluctance to continue to fund um, humanitarian and development operations in Yemen when there isn't a, a discernible political track uh, uh, yet, that has yet emerged. I do think there are a number of things in our favor. As the foreign minister pointed out, there is a willingness on the part of the Saudis. They declared a ceasefire, uh, their openness to a ceasefire back in March. Uh, I think the Yemen government is keen to, to support that. There's been a lot of movement of, of fuel ships through Hudayda port, which has eased, uh, eased the humanitarian situation somewhat. We'd like to see all of those restrictions lifted. But I have to agree that the other side has been uh, more intent on pursuing a military solution. And if you look at Marib, which is something that you highlighted right at the outset, Maria, there is an ongoing offensive there. Um, and it's clear that the Houthis intend to try to bring down the Yemen government. Uh, the Iranians, I believe, would like to see the same. And so the international community has really tried to draw a line here and say the Marib offensive should stop, that if the Houthis are serious about peace, which many of their statements suggest that they are, but then when you look at the actual situation on the ground and how they continue to pursue this offensive, it speaks otherwise. And there's a lot at stake here. I mean, not only, uh, you know, sort of stability of, of North Yemen, but the large inter internally displaced population, which has already fled other areas of the conflict to come to Marib and is now under uh, essentially daily a threat, uh, daily attack by, by the Houthis. So this is a, a, an important, uh, you know, centerpiece of the whole effort. But I urge you not to be quite so pessimistic and, and, and others. I think that in 2022, we're going to see better, better progress as these issues get defined more clearly, as the UN envoy comes on board, and as U.S. efforts uh, continue in support of a peaceful resolution. Yeah, I want to follow up on what you just said, because, I mean, um, here there are two uh, governments that have been, let's say, I mean, we as journalists have always defined this war a proxy war. 
facts, meaning that Saudis and Iran are involved in it. So does a ceasefire necessarily have to go, I mean, one has to bring at the table also Riyadh and Tehran, and is that the problem that it doesn't come to, uh, that the Houthis don't sit down? Because probably you say Saudis and the, Houth and the Yemeni government are ready to sit at the table, but probably Iran is not yet ready, on, or there's something else at stake. Could that be the case? And that's a question that I pose to both, to first to the minister and then to Timothy Lenderking. Minister, please. I think part of the solution is to understand the nature of this conflict, because sometimes, I mean, uh, looking to the uh, uh, conflict in Yemen just as a proxy war and not understanding the internal factor of this war, I think this, is, uh, this narrative is some of the problem. It just, you know that Houthis occupied the capital in September 2014. Months before that, they start, you know, marching from Saada uh, uh, to, to, the, to the northern government. In, 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 March 2000, uh, in March 2015, the Saudis interfered in Yemen. So after seven months, uh, after the Houthis occupied the capital and they marched to, toward the, uh, the, the south, they, they airstrike the, the, the palace of the president, they put the, the entire government under home arrest. So it was internal conflict for months, and the Saudis was uh, out well, of... that was some years ago, but I mean, no, 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 it's important to know that, because, yeah, you know, of now, course, of course. now if, if we now say that the, the Saudi will get out of the scene, that will resolve the problem, we'll not resolve the problem. Houthis will not stop. No, no, I said that one has to bring but all the parties at the table. Well, you know, this is not the first time we have, we call for ceasefire. I, I mean, in Stockholm in 2018, the entire world supported the Stockholm Agreement in 2018. And we agreed on ceasefire in Hodeida. Since 2018 up to now, according to the reports, Houthis violated the ceasefire, 30,000 violation against the, the ceasefire. And that, that uh, Houthis, they, they were in this, uh, and they agreed on, on, on the agreement. In the current one, in the current one, the Iranian, they announced that they, they're going to support any peace process. Houthis, is, you know, we have to understand whom Houthis are and what are the source of their ideology. Our problem with the Houthis, not that we are not accepting them as a faction in the Yemeni society. In, in Stok we had four rounds of talks with Houthis and every five. And every, in every round of talks, we discuss with them ceasefire, truce or, or ceasefire. We discuss with them economical and humanitarian arrangement. Every time we discuss these issues in Kuwait, we agreed on them in details. And on why did it all, didn't it come, well, when did it break down? One what of was the, the point? One of the, the main problem, it's ideology, because they believe yeah. that they are superior and they have divide right through Yemen. So this is, this is, this is rooted in their ideology. So uh, it's a cultural problem, it, it's, it, it's, it's a religious, uh, a sectarian uh, uh, ideology. Believe that they are superior than the other Yemenis. Uh, they are not mm. except. Our condition is very, our, our prerequisite is very simple. That they have to respect that all Yemenis are equal. If they accept that, we don't have problem at all with the Houthis. So how do you deal with that, Dr. Uh, Lenderkin? But, but if, if you allow me, this is one of the issues. The other things is the, uh, the, the negative Iranian rule. Iran is using so Yemen is, as a bargaining sh sh yeah. ship, and they want to get something in Yemen uh, while they are you know, negotiating, negotiating in, in Vienna and in the other files. So uh, it seems to me that, when, that uh, it is still far apart till you sit down on a table and agree on something. We, we because a said. cultural problem can be very easy or even very, very difficult to we, overcome. We, we, we sat different time. <laughs> we sat together different time. Dr. Lenderking, I want to pull you in. What do you think about this? I mean, we just heard that one of the problems is a cultural problem. The other one is, of course, Iran. There are two tracks that have to be worked on, at least uh, with this conflict, Maria. One is, uh, as the minister said, there is an internal Yemeni conflict, and that, that will have to be dealt with primarily uh, by Yemenis themselves. And if we look back to previous models of Yemeni engagement, uh, good things can happen, progress can be made, and ultimately uh, this is Yemen, Yemeni, the country that belongs to Yemenis, and they should be the ones deciding their own future. 
But there are obviously external elements, and it's not just Iran and Saudi Arabia. There are other Gulf countries who have a stake in the outcome. The minister mentioned the Omanis. It's a neighboring country. The Omanis have a huge stake in what happens in Yemen and a stake to ensure that further division of the country uh, doesn't happen. With regard to Iran, I think you know there is, uh, there is discussion about to what extent the Iranians could be involved in a, a resolution of the problem. And I think from the United States point of view, we would welcome that if we felt that uh, Iran were prepared to play a constructive role. And thus far, we haven't seen that. We've seen arm, you know, arming and training of the Houthis, and and also, uh, you know, there was a there was an Iranian attack on on uh, Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago on the oil platforms, which they then blamed on the Houthis. Um, so we haven't seen that their that their that their role is a positive one. If you look at even uh, the comments of the of the Hezbollah secretary general in Lebanon trying to hype, uh, hype and fan the flames of the offensive in Marib, um, that's, that's not helpful. So, and, and there's a great deal that's at stake here. I mean, it's not just that piece of real estate uh, of Yemen, but it's the waterways, the vital waterways around Yemen, the Bab al-Mandeb and the Straits of Hormuz, uh, which are not just for the passage of oil and energy resources. This is world. This is the world economy. This is world trade, um, you know, up through the Red Sea and and the Suez Canal. So there's there's a lot at stake here for the for the world, and that's why the United States under this administration has decided to put more of an emphasis on this conflict. This is not just a remote regional uh, conflict among you know tribes that nobody's ever heard of before. This has real stakes for the for the global economy not to forget the fact that there is an al-qaeda presence and an isis presence in yemen as well that must be addressed well that's interesting i mean so uh, yemen is vital for the economy so also for the united states and for the world so that's uh, it is as you said not some far away conflict between some tribes but it is at the center of trade routes that could affect the whole world. So for the Biden administration, how important is Yemen? And I mean, Biden took a completely different uh, standpoint uh, than his predecessor, Trump. I mean, he wants a diplomatic approach. I mean, so you stepped out of, America stepped out of the Saudi-led coalition. It is not anymore in engaged on a side, but what wants to broker a ceasefire. So what does Yemen mean for the U.S.? Those factors that I mentioned are, are very much, um, you know, very much at the heart of it. I think there is, uh, there is, there are, are implications, as I say, for these vital waterways for the world economy. Uh, there is a terrorist uh, element there, Al-Qaeda. That uh, element has struck at the United States before, if you look at the USS Cole. Um, back in 2000, um, and there, you know, there's there's been a history of of Al Qaeda elements wandering around and and seeking refuge uh, in in Yemen. So that that also has to be dealt with. And I mentioned the the ISIS piece as well. I think that needs not to be forgotten. And then on top of that, as as the minister notes, um, there is uh, the you know the, this warfare that that involves several regional countries. And then I think, you know, lastly, and what, what is a very important priority for the Biden administration is addressing the humanitarian situation. So yesterday I was, um, I met with David Beasley, the head of the World Food Program uh, here in Washington, and we talked about, you know, with all the other priorities that are, that are uh, surging into the front, front lines of the world humanitarian community, you've got Afghanistan, of course, trending very badly, uh, the Ethiopian conflict, which also has huge implications for the Horn of Africa in terms of displaced people, in terms of uh, destruction of, uh, of infrastructure, uh, possibly flight of refugees, et cetera. And I urged him, and I know this is an open door for the head of the World Food Program, but we cannot forget about Yemen. And that's also a message for the donors who are being pulled in many different directions, asked to support this conflict and this conflict and so forth. Let's not forget Yemen. 
its very urgent and vital needs uh, with food insecurity, with internal displacement, with damaged infrastructure, and um, and and as as the minister said, COVID, you know, on top of all this. So you won't see any retreat uh, from the United States in terms of our commitment to resolving this crisis. You won't see any, uh, you know, movement toward China of resources that we need for, uh, you know, for resolving this conflict. So we're, we're all in. Well, um, I wanted to ask you both, I mean, how important would you think that the UN, the Human Rights Commission, they wanted to put, um, to have an investigation on human rights violation in Yemen. And this commission has been voted out, there won't be any. Would it have been important if it would have been in place? Or, I mean, would it have been putting uh, a ceasefire negotiation closer, putting all the things on the table, being frank about what is happening or not? Because uh, The Guardian uh, published a few days ago a report in, uh, citing UN sources, and it's a pity that we don't have the UN envoy for Yemen, I would have asked him, uh, saying that there has been quite some pressure uh, done by the Saudis to vote against this commission. But according to you, would this commission have brought peace talks closer or not? I ask you both. First. Okay. Well, I th we, uh, as Yemeni government, I mean, we have uh, the, the Human Rights Commissioner has an office in Aden, uh, and we are dealing with all their mechanism. Uh, uh, they have free access for all information. They can do an investigation, and we are dealing with them, you know, and we are co cooperating with them. We think, I mean, if you are, uh, you know, referring to the uh, prominent experts uh, 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 group, I mean, uh, we think that some of the uh, of their works have been uh, politicized. So, uh, uh, but uh, the, the panel of experts belong to the Security Council, the Sanction Committee. Also, they have free access and they and their reports. You, you will have a lot of, of uh, you know, uh, 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 records about the, the human rights violation. And we, as Yemen government, we received them several times, four times. They were in Aden and they visited uh, certain governments in Yemen. So bringing the human rights uh, violation, we, as Yemen government, we welcome that. But we have an issue with that prominent uh, experts because, and we discussed this during the uh, uh, Human Rights Council. So it's a, a problem of the people that have been put up. Uh, the mechanism the bias, itself, because you, you know, because in Yemen we have our own uh, internal mechanism, also supported by the by, by the Human Rights Council, mm -hmm. and the only country which we have international and local, uh, 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 you know, mechanism competing and fighting each other in Yemen. And we said that that, that is not a good model. Let's find a, a model uh, or a new modalities where we can benefit from the international inputs, but also for you know having sustainable uh, mechanism, uh, protecting the human rights in Yemen for a long time and sustainable uh, procedure. Let's, let's get this modalities. That was our, our main observation. Dr. Lender King, what is your point? Would that, would this, investigation, this commission, would it have been um, useful? Oh, absolutely. We, we do feel it would have been a group of experts, as the minister uh, referred to. Uh, we thought it was a mistake that this uh, that there were such uh, votes against its existence, and we'd like to see it reinstated. I mean, obviously, when we're talking about accountability in this conflict, uh, there is accountability on all sides that needs to be uh, that needs to be upheld. And so, when we talk about you know human rights concerns, and we write about this in our annual human rights report, um, there are there are human rights violations on all sides, uh, and and they do need to be documented. And you know they need to be worked on, uh, not just documented, but there need to 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 be efforts uh, that uh, that work to ameliorate. And mitigate uh, these these problems, um, and so we would like to see the the group uh, reinstated. As as we think that anything that um, sort of points toward accountability for the various parties is is important in this wartime uh, mm -hmm. conflict. Well, yes, that is probably I mean the most difficult part. I mean how to bring both parts to agree on because war. I mean. Uh, human rights violation usually, I mean, in all the conflict I've watched and I've been into personally, 
you see them on both sides. But to bring both sides to agree, that's rather difficult. Uh, but now I'd like you to, to ask you both, I mean, there is um, a real emergency regarding civilians uh, that in Marib are under attack now, but especially children, malnutrition. That has been documented throughout the years. As a government, I mean, what are the steps, the short-term steps that you are able to do? What are your requests? I mean, to bring food to the children, to the women, to the people who need it. Because that is, I think, the urgency at the moment. Yeah, well, you know, this is this is a man-made. This is, you know, I, I mean, this is not because of natural disaster. This no. is, a, a, if we didn't fix the source of the problem, and we, we will keep have, having this, uh, this problem. Now, seven years, we are discussing, we are prolonging the conflict and trying to follow and deal with its uh, consequences. Uh, for, for, for me, tackling Yemen just from a humanitarian perspective and ignoring the other, uh, it's prolonging the, 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 the conflict. No doubt that there is uh, you know, a difficult situation in Yemen. But not, not, uh, there are many reasons for that. And this is, we used to say that, but now it's the international reports who indicated that. Looting the aids by the Houthis, this is World Food Program. For the first time, David Bisley and Security Council, he mentioned that. Uh, uh, and underfunded, uh, you know, uh, budget for the uh, humanitarian response plan. I mean, the international community has to, you know, uh, funded the, this this response plan to enable the INGO, uh, the international uh, humanitarian organization, to to do their duties in in, in in Yemen. Speaking out about all the 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 the, the, the violation against the unfair distribution of aids. Uh, not not having access to the international humanitarian in all the areas controlled by the by the Houthis. In 2018, when we signed the Stockholm Agreement, you, main part of, of, of this of this of this agreement was lifting the siege in Taiz. Taiz is uh, the most populated government in Yemen. Now, seven years under siege, people are dying there. For the first time, David Grisley, the, 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 uh, humor, uh, the, the, the humanitarian, uh, the UN humanitarian coordinator, he paid his first, first, first visit a few months ago. And no one is talking, uh, talking about that. So if you want to, to improve the situation in Yemen, I, I mean, we have uh, uh, to identify the, ma the main problems. You know, in the areas controlled by the militias, most of the public servants, they are not getting paid, they are not getting salaries for months, not because there is no food, supply of food in the market, but because they are not able to, 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 uh, you know, to, to get this, uh, this, this, this food. It's not a matter of av availability, but it's a matter of aff affordability. So I, I mean, put all these issues together. Uh, if we can do more in, 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 in these issues, I, I mean, we can, we, we can deal with the, with the urgent and immediate issues. This is one. Secondly, Yemen doesn't need just relief, just basket food. Without supporting directly the Yemeni economy, the central bank, I mean, you know, the Yemeni real is losing its value. Uh, so uh, even, even if you pump millions of dollars and the, the, the Yemeni real keep losing its value, uh, the purchasing power of the people, uh, the resilience of people will be very vulnerable. So uh, uh, now we have a government who is functioning from Aden, uh, in Aden, in Yemen, close to the people, needs to, to, to have direct support. So what support. is the government doing, I mean, uh, to address this? Because, I mean, you have to give answers also to your people that need jobs, food, uh, and uh, a vision of a future, because that would, is a trust building. Well, well, you know, first, I mean, forming the government uh, from all walks of, uh, all the parties except Houthis, uh, functioning from Aden, uh, uh, doing some economical reform, uh, anti-corruption procedures we already started and, and, and announced, uh, dealing with the, with the, with the international uh, community, uh, providing services. We improved I mean, uh, many of the services, uh, uh, free access for the, uh, for the INGOs. We are working hard you know, to, to send this message to our people because our people need to see their government close to them functioning you know, f from the, the, their, their uh, interim capital, trying to resolve the problem. Although the challenges that we have in our plate is, is too much. Without support from, from the international community and from our neighbors, I mean, it, it will be an impossible mission for, th for this government. Dr. Lender King, wh what do you think are the priorities and how can one tackle, I mean, this 
kind of emergency that, I mean, is giving answers to basic human needs? Well, certainly the, the civilians are bearing the brunt of the conflict. There's no question about that. They're, they're you know, in the crossfire, uh, and, uh, and there has been too much disregard of civilian life here as the war has progressed. And, and by the way, I would also add civilians inside the kingdom, because the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, because there have been some 375 cross-border attacks so far this year, by the Houthis, um, some of these are clearly aimed at civilian targets. I mean, the airport in Riyadh, uh, uh, the airport in Jazan in southern Saudi Arabia. I mean, these are these are uh, these are civilian. Uh, it's part of civilian infrastructure, um, and and we all fear that uh, that over time there will be a mass uh, mass hit on civilians inside this inside Saudi Arabia. So that's another factor that we bear in mind as we as American officials look out for uh, the welfare and safety of 70,000 Americans who live inside Saudi Arabia. So there's that dimension as well. Uh, the minister is absolutely right to highlight, I think, the economic, the dire economic factors. And when I was with him in Aden three weeks ago, this is a, this is a key element that we talked about with him and, and, and the prime minister, the importance of economic support for Yemen, the, the, the civilian salaries, as he notes, that have not been paid, um, this is a huge issue. Um, and, and so Yemen does need economic support, stabilizing its currency, helping uh, stabilize its financial institutions, the Central Bank of Yemen. Um, these are, I think, a centra central parts and would make uh, the provision of humanitarian aid a more stable proposition. I'm very very glad that the United States is a leading donor on the humanitarian side, more than $4 billion that we've given to Yemen since the conflict began seven years ago. I also know that, that ourselves and other donors would feel much more confident in the, uh, in the impact of our humanitarian contributions were the economy to, to stabilize. So this is an urgent situation. And lastly, we have to make sure that civilians are able to be reached by the humanitarian aid, and that there is no uh, no obstruction. We've had a we've had a uh, you know <clears throat> serious issues dealing with the Houthis on this issue over the last couple of years, where they have they have put down impediments and obstructions to humanitarian to the provision of aid. Some of those have been eased. I'm glad to see, but but you know it's really important that that everyone. Uh, make the distribution and the monitoring that goes with it uh, a key element of the humanitarian peace. So we, we would like to see this. And, and lastly, borders, ports, airports need to be open in Yemen so that uh, vital commercial supplies can continue to move throughout the country. Minister, could you um, outline what are the main problems that, I mean, aid is coming what are the problems that your government faces in distributing the aid so that this aid really reaches the people because one that is one of the main problems that it doesn't reach all the people uh, that in uh, in the government controlled areas no, in, the, in the government control area i mean uh, there is no problem and the, um, uh, i had meetings on, on monthly basis with the uh, ingos we don't have real problem either logistic problem or uh, structural problem in, in distributing the, the, the aid. There is underfunded uh, programs in many areas. Give you an example in Marib. Marib, uh, at the beginning of the war, it, wa it was hosting just 350,000. You know now how many people are living in Marib? Four million within, within five, six years. All the families, all the people in the areas controlled by the militias, they flee from th these areas because they face problem to Marib. So in Marib, in Marib now, we have not less than two million IDBs living in camps in, 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 and the others inside the city. So there is huge needs in these areas. While if you see how, how many, how many uh, INGOs are, are, are you know, uh, serving those people or you know, providing them with the aid, uh, very little. So we want to increase you know, uh, uh, the so presence. The problem of funding. Uh, of funding, increasing of uh, the numbers of international organizations. This is one. Secondly, the problem that we are facing in, in Marib. Marib is now under attack. Marib is the, uh, heavily populated. 
Yemenis, you know, in Europe, you don't have that much refugees from Yemen comparing to the other countries because Yemenis still hope tomorrow will be better and they managed to escape from an, a city to another city. Now Marib, it became last, uh, last, uh, last heaven. Uh, if Houthis stormed the, uh, the city, this is, would be the real disaster because Yemenis first will lose hope. Uh, this is their last heaven. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very afraid from this, from, from, from this scenario. And this is one of the issues. As we are now here in the Mediterranean dialogue, we have to emphasize and focus on these issues because this is one of the mutual interests that we have to pay more attention, not by saying what, what's happening in, in Yemen will not affect uh, uh, you know, uh, this part of the world. Secondly, we have very important issues uh, concerning the, the environmental security, which is the cipher tanker. You know, more than one million, one million barrel of, uh, of oil in, in a very old tanker, uh, potential r uh, international risk. If that split out or exp uh, any explosion happened, this is will affect the Red Sea and it will reach the, uh, the Mediterranean. Mm. Houthi is now for five years refusing to give access to the, to, 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 the, to the UN teams, technical teams, to evaluate the, the situation of the tanker and to do the, the, the required maintenance. This is second issues, I think, concern both of, uh, uh, of us, I mean, in the Red Sea region and the, the Mediterranean. The third um, very important thing, which is the international maritime. Uh, Houthis, uh, you look, look to the threats that the, 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 the sea mine and the land mines that they are throwing in, in, uh, in the sea. Uh, 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 and this how affect the international maritimes. This is issues, yes, it's, you, you can see it from our perspective as Yemeni uh, problem, but this is affecting uh, uh, you know, severely uh, the region and the entire world. Well, um, you pointed out, I mean, that Marib is crucial. So it is as if you were saying, I mean, uh, we can't come to a ceasefire till the situation in Marib has been, uh, there is an end to the war, the conflict in Marib. And at the moment, do you see it possible that Marib's conflict can end through diplomatic talks or it will be fought on the ground? What do you think, Minister? Well, uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, if there is a will, we, 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 can, we can reach ceasefire tomorrow. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, the, yeah, uh, if there is the will, peace can happen tomorrow in the world. But, 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 but you know, there is a party yeah. who refu 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 refused okay. to, 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 to do this. For, 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 me, for me, for me, Marib is a cornerstone. Uh, uh, if, if, if the fighting continue in Marib and, uh, and Houthis uh, think that they can make a, a military victory, uh, this is will collapse the entire uh, peace process and it will have very negative impact in everything. How worried are you, Dr. Lender King, about Ma that Marib could bring things to topple if I it's not, so uh, there's no diplomatic solution to it? Well, we do, uh, we do, you know, publicly, as I mentioned, we really, and many other countries, by the way, and this is a united, uh, united worldview. I think if you look at the P5, you look at the UN Security Council statements that it has issued about Marib, um, there are only two countries, I think, that want to see, uh, or one, that's Iran, that wants to see, you know, this, this offensive perpetuated. So the Houthis are really going against the current of world opinion here. And this is seen as uh, sort of a test case here of Houthi willingness to, um, you know, move in, move away from a military solution into a political solution. They've been talking about uh, and pursuing Marib for a long time. It's not just this year, but it was last year. But there, you know, there are renewed offensives here, and they're pursuing it very vigorously now. We have indications that they have no intention of stopping. By the way, they're taking casualties at twice the rate of the other side, um, and they're you know recruiting uh, young men from from the villages, uh, often through intimidation and pressure. The Houthis control about eighty percent of the population of Yemen, so they have a supply of uh, of the population that they continue to to uh, forcibly recruit. And of course, you know the 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 battle is tinged with these sort of messianic pronouncements um, rooted in Islam and the, and the history of Yemen as a way of, of you know, inspiring people to continue to fight. Um, 
but it is it is very costly for for the Houthis, and and by extension, it's very costly for the Yemeni people uh, to to be uh, you know recruited into this effort and sent to the front lines, um, and then the Saudi-led coalition is there. Uh, you know, this is really a point where where de escal if 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 everybody's serious about de escalation, it should happen here. I'm skeptical that the Houthis will, uh, you know, internalize that. But I think I think you know their pursuit of a military solution is exposed here in the Marib conflict, um, and there is a lot at stake. I think, as the as the minister points out, we need to use this diplomatic space while we have it to continue to drive for a political solution. That, that's where our our efforts, the UN efforts, the efforts of the GCC. The Gulf Cooperation Council, whom we've spent a lot of time with in the last few months, particularly going back to Secretary Blink uh, Secretary Blinken's meeting with the GCC ministers at the UN General Assembly in September. We will do that again soon. The GCC has a role here as a regional uh, as a regional center that is get getting back on its feet after four years of rift uh, and reuniting and can play a helpful role. All by which to say that. The international community, I think, should continue its efforts uh, to uh, to push for a political solution, which means the end of the offensive in Marib. Well, um, I, I do gather that you are rather worried. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, how worried are you? Because I think uh, there's a lot at stake exactly now in Marib. Do you think that it will would come to a ceasefire or not? Because I do think that we only have few months ahead to see uh, if it can come to a ceasefire or not. Uh, well, uh, do you agree with that? Uh, I, I, I repeated that our, our aim, we are v v very, uh, yeah. very keen to have ceasefire. Uh, we are also very confident that we can defend Marib, uh, uh, our troops, our tribes, uh, resistance elements there. Uh, 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 Marib, uh, it can be turning points. I mean, in, in this war, uh, Houthis since the beginning of the war, every time they announced that next week they're going to uh, storm and enter the, the, the city, uh, they didn't succeed. But yet, I mean, our problem is with, with their illusions. They have th this kind of illusions, full with uh, ideology. For that reason, they don't want to stop. You know why? Because they didn't, uh, you know, uh, there is no uh, real interest for them for peace because they want more time. He just mentioned, he just mentioned that the numbers of kids that they are sending them to the front line. If I share with you just what, st what type of materials that they are teaching now our kids uh, at the school or at the su summer course, what they call it summer course, last summer, they announced that they recruited 60,000 Yemeni kids and if you, if you see, even when they teach them math, uh, you know, calculation, it's about how much they're going to kill American, Jewish, uh, the other Yemenis, the other, you know, the other schools of, of Islam. And this is what concerns us even more, the humanitarian tragedy that we have now, even more than the life that we lose, which is, uh, you know, well, import of important. Of course, fundamentalism is there and it will spread. I mean, we had the same things in the 90s with the Taliban's uh, And no one is paying attention to that because yeah. even if we end, uh, end, the end the war tomorrow, this is something will stay with us generation to come and we will suffer from, uh, for, from it. For we have a real interest to end the war because we don't want that to expand. Mm. Uh, we, we, we concern more about our social fabric, about the future of our kids, the education, so we will work. We will not spare any efforts to end this war. So any chance, any opportunity for peace, we will jump to it. Uh, since we are here now in Rome, last question to you both. I mean, of course, what could Europe's role be? Is there, I mean, this is a regional conflict that has implications, <coughs> as Dr. Lender King told us, I mean, reminded us, worldwide. Can Europe have a role? Is it having one or not? Uh, definitely. I, I, I mean, uh, political, economical, humanitarian roles. I mean, first, uh, uh, I call for an int integral or integrated approach because now it's, it's only humanitarian uh, concern and approach. 
What I'm calling for is more political, economical, and humanitarian approach, and adopt, this is the time, the right time, to adopt this, this comprehensive uh, approach, not just, not, not just uh, one angle. Politically, I mean, we need, we need Europe to voicing uh, that and to send a strong message to the Houthis and to the Iranian. Uh, uh, economically, I mean, they have to expand their coordination and cooperation with the Yemeni government, current uh, uh, government, and make some balance and their donation between the relief and the developmental projects. We need to see that because this is will give hope to the, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the Yemenis. Did you get answers to those questions? Sorry? Did you get any? Well, uh, we are trying. Uh, uh, okay. You know, I made two, two, two European tours. Uh, I, I can say that, you know, I, can, I, 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 I noticed change in the narrative. People start to see, uh, so you see this from the different angles. The messages that they start to sending to the Houthis uh, uh, is it's, it's pretty strong. We need more. And use all the tools, uh, tools that they have. You know, I appreciate very much, I mean, Biden administration, they start sanction uh, the, the, the financial networks of Houthis. And this is one of the soft cars that uh, the international world have. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, will not affect the, the ordinary people, but this is, will, 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 will send a strong message to, to, uh, uh, to the hard li liner within the movement. Uh, Dr. Lender King, I mean, Biden's approach is also sort of forcing Europe to, let's put it, quotation, sort of take its own responsibilities in the area. Uh, it's a very different approach from Trump's muscular approach. Uh, mm. Do you think, I mean, what should Europe, what should Europe's role be, according to you, in this situation? I'd call it uh, muscular diplomacy, which is to say that we are <laughs> very much, uh, you know, uh, coordinating with the EU uh, countries, both both the EU as an institution and then uh, individual countries. Uh, you look at the role that, you know, Sweden plays a very active. Their foreign minister has been to Yemen, to Sanaa. Uh, we, we talk regularly to the Dutch, uh, the French. Um, you know, there are a number of countries. That they're also donors, as the minister said. Let's not uh, overlook the Safra tanker, which is an issue that the, the, which the minister highlighted, which is a combined UN-US, Yemen government, uh, EU uh, member states uh, effort to get those UN inspectors on board that ship to assess and to uh, you know, figure out a plan to get, get that oil that's sitting there and could, uh, you know, could slosh into the Red Sea at any moment, causing a, an environmental disaster. That's just another area where we in the EU cooperate. So this is a very important alliance. And, and I think there's, there's really no daylight between us and the European countries in terms of our determination to see this conflict resolved and bring the resources that we have to bear to apply to it. Well, at our time is up and I thank the audience who stayed numerous to listen. And I thank uh, Timothy Lenderking for being so frank as usual and giving us the insight. And of course, the Minister for Foreign Affairs from Yemen, Bin thank Mubarak. You. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Very much. Next year in presence. Thank you.